Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with multi-read composer and leader Brian Kroc of Brooklyn's jazz collective called the Big Heart Machine. He spoke about their latest 2018 CD, Big Heart Machine, their debut album, produced by multi-Grammy-nominated composer and band leader Darcy James Argue. Featuring a vast range of music that explores the intersection of jazz improvisation, contemporary composition, and heavy metal aesthetics. He also got into the roots of this 18-piece Brooklyn big band and all of its musicians. He is originally from Chicago and has spent some time at Kansas City. He talks about all of that, the future of the band, and so much more. So please get to know him, this collective, and dig this interview, my friends. So, Brian, thank you for taking a minute on behalf of the Big Heart Machine to talk with Neon Jazz here in Kansas City. I appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you guys actually are a part of, of watching this jazz plasma universe of ours, this audio liquidity kind of spread out the way it is. And there's so many elements. There's so many things. There's new sounds and new elements. You guys represent this kind of almost renegade sound, so to speak. It, 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 you know, I love the collectives. I love the big outfits. But you guys have such a great sound. So up front, I just want to say I really enjoy the album and I'm Looking forward to kind of peeling back the layers of your guys' history and how you guys operate as an outfit. Cool. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. That's, it's always great to hear that the music's connecting with people. Well, you know, I think the one thing that's interesting about the way we look at things is, is that we get pigeonholed into thinking there was only one era of real change or several eras in jazz like bebop and whatnot, but I think mm-hmm. you can get so close to something you don't understand that things are actually happening right now and changing in ways that only history will be able to look back and say, hey, that was what was going on then, you know, so. Hmm, yeah. Um, but at any rate, talk to me about this album, Big Heart Machine. <laughs> That's a broad prop. The band Big Heart Machine basically started when I first moved to New York. Um, I moved out here to study with uh, the great composer Jim McNeely, and I started throwing together basically reading sessions with friends to hear the music that I was working on with Jim. Um, so I'd have weekly lessons with him. And, you know, when you're writing for such a large ensemble, you just, you have, you don't really have any idea what it really is going to sound like until you hear people play it. You use your imagination and you try your best, but, um, but you have to have people playing the music. So those reading sessions with my friends sort of, turned into a gig here or there, and over the next five or six years, we started gigging more often. So I set this sort of goal two years ago to make a recording, and that was a whole wormhole, a huge learning experience, setting up a recording and and making it financially, you know, feasible for 20-plus people. Um, And now the goal with the band is is just to keep it, uh, keep the spirit of creativity alive and and work more play uh, play more often and uh, continue to sort of challenge ourselves to to write and record even you know even better music and, and more personal and sincere you know ideas and you had a pretty big name in jazz produce the album that's true yeah um, and that was a very lucky situation um, Darcy James argue produced the record but aside from the fact that Darcy is a genius and uh, definitely one of the most sort of comprehensive musicians that I've ever known, just in terms of the the breadth and depth of of what he knows. He also is just like a super generous and thoughtful person. So he doesn't really produce records, actually. He's just, he's so busy that that's not really an aspect of his career because he's constantly writing commissions and, and he teaches at not one but two different you know, higher ed institutions, and so he. So it was like a huge sort of leap of faith for him to become involved, and it also meant a lot to the band, you know, to us, because it, it's sort of his interest in the music let us know that we were on the right track, if you know what I mean. So it was 
just incredibly lucky that he was free and that he was willing to, to work with us. And he, his contribution to the music was insanely big. <laughs> right on. So the name of the group is rather unique. How did that come about? There's sort of two elements to that. I realized as we were embarking on the recording project that I really don't like the jazz sort of uh, tradition of people calling bands, you know, Brian Crocs, blank, blank, blank. You know, you know how jazz groups always, there's yeah. always the sort of leader's name attached to it. You know, no, no judgment to people who do that because, um, it is important to get your name out there in the world and stuff. But when I started thinking about the music that I loved growing up and what inspired me the most, I just think that a band name is much more interesting than my own name. And I also thought it was important to send the message to the greater world that, um, that this isn't just my project. This is an incredibly collaborative project that a huge team, a, a big community of people contributes lots of their time and energy to performing and running. And, you know, it's a huge endeavor. So I knew I wanted it to, to be a bigger thing than just my own name or something. I, I knew I wanted it to have an, uh, a band name. I just thought that was a more interesting um, an exciting idea. I had had another band that was called Heart Machine. Um, we never ended up making a record because I got a big opportunity to go on tour and I ended up being on the road for a long time and that band fizzled out. It was a great band. It was um, Adam O'Farrell on trumpet, myself on saxophone, um, Jason Berger on drums, and Sam Yolsman on piano. I wanted to continue Heart Machine, but I wanted more people to be involved. So I made it Big Heart Machine. And now that, you know, naming a, a group is, I'm sure it's the same with naming a podcast or, you know, just picking a name for something is incredibly difficult. And um, and I've never felt like I was good at it. But the name Big Heart Machine has taken on a life of its own. And so and I'm happy with it, you know. Yeah. And I also think it, it, it describes the project really well because we're all in this for love. And... Um, and it is really uh, a behemoth of a band, so. Without a doubt. How long have you guys been together? Well, the current iteration of the band is essentially the people who did the recording session. So um, as with any any sort of collaborative artistic endeavor, it's always hard to to, like, synchronize schedules and stuff. And so a lot of the original people that I was working with before, you know, I was calling the band the Brian Crock Large Ensemble. A lot of those people aren't really in the band anymore just because scheduling got tough. So the current lineup has been together for maybe three years now. Basically from the time that we started actively working towards the first recording. But right on. I've been playing with the, the you know, the, essentially the same group of people for six or seven years now, basically since I've lived in New York. I've, 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 I was lucky to sort of find my um, collaborative uh, people early on, and I've continued to work with them for the whole time that I've been here. So the way you describe your band on your website is, is that you're kind of paying an homage to creative music. There's no real specific hearkening to jazz history. But my question is this. If you had to pick several musicians that kind of embody, not even really embody, but it, but influence the way you go about your jazz pursuit. Who do you think those would be? Uh, that's a great question, and it's I'm sure it's a hard question for any musician to answer. Uh, the thing is that I don't have, I'm not, I try not to be too precious with, um, with one genre. You know, I, I love jazz, and I and I play jazz more than any other genre, but I don't consider. I try I try to remind myself constantly that every genre has um, has great things that you can learn from, and um, and to to take influences from the wider world of art, not just jazz music, and not just music. When I'm like sort of daydreaming and thinking about what 
I would like my contribution of of sort of my you know whole life to be to art. I think about basically iconoclastic artists um, from any era that um, that sort of had the courage to do something unique. So it, it's really hard to pick. And uh, since you've heard the record, I'm sure you know that it would be challenging to pick specific influences because I try to let everything find its way into the music. Um, but my biggest heroes are, um, I'm incredibly inspired by Jim McNeely, um, who I, you know, I, I'm lucky enough to know as a person and have studied with, but, um, but I think that he's a living, uh, genius and, um, and maybe an underappreciated one. My first and, and sort of the, the well that I always go back to is Charlie Parker, you know, in terms of, not just the the level of his playing, but the the sort of groundbreaking nature of his genius. So that's a, that's a constant source of inspiration. And also another one is the Hungarian composer Georgi Ligeti. But Ligeti is was a 20th century classical composer who uh, I find inspiring for a multitude of reasons. Um, one is that he lives behind the Iron Curtain, if you will. He lived in a totalitarian government that didn't allow any um, Western influence. And so the music that he was expected to write was sort of this nationalistic Hungarian bullshit, basically. Um, it, he's got a similar story to a composer like uh, Shostakovich, Dmitry Shostakovich. So the, the creative music that he wrote, he just wrote for himself. He actually never expected to hear it early on in his life. Um, he he ca- he's called it writing for the drawer, meaning he was going to write it and then just put it in a drawer and forget about it. I think that that sort of mentality about making music is um, counterintuitively the probably the best way to write is not thinking about any sort of audience, but just writing what you truly think you need to write. So that's that's sort of what I try to do with Big Heart Machine. So if you were to come to Kansas City and you had to kind of in the in the, in the notion of, of brevity for like say a tweet or something along those lines and convince somebody that they needed to come see you guys at a venue here, you're coming in, you're playing, how would you bill your show? How would you describe what you're doing, what your sound is, and what you're going to give a crowd? <laughs> that's a great question. Um, and unfortunately, I am... I am not social media oriented, um, so brevity and tweeting is tough for me, but I'll do my best to answer that question. By the way, I have been to Kansas City a few times. I'm, I'm from the Midwest. Um, I'm from Chicago, Illinois, and um, I love Kansas City. Um, right on. Uh, so, so here's what I would say. I would, I've been surprised, to tell you the truth, how well attended Big Heart Machine concerts have been around we last year we we did a couple of shows. We did a, um, a show in D.C. and one in Chicago, as well as a bunch of shows in New York. And I think it's just a naturally exciting thing because it's so big. So maybe I would say a giant ensemble of rule-breaking improvisers exploring music that is just beyond their grasp, or something like that. Does that answer your question? Yep, yeah, absolutely. That's exactly what I was looking for. So my follow-up to that is, what's the future of this band? How long, you know, do you want to have kids and have the kids carry the torch? Is this uh, a creative interlude? What do you see the future of this band being? Hmm, that's a great question. Um, I know that for myself, Big Heart Machine is going to be a lifelong endeavor. Initiating this project ended up giving me gifts that I just could never have envisioned years ago. It's given my life sort of direction, um, and it's given my um, composing practice um, focus. And so I am I already know exactly what I want our next project to be. I have dreams for the future. Um, and with such a large ensemble, every project is a multiple-year endeavor, you know, so... The future, the immediate future of the band is that um, we're playing uh, our first sort of major festival uh, next week. Um, we're playing the New York City Winter Jazz Fest. And I'm working um, on a daily basis to book the band um, at 
more sort of markets around the world because I had such a great time presenting the music in D.C. and in Chicago. So I want to figure out ways to get the music to a broader audience. For the long-term future, I just I just am going to do what I need to do to keep the band going. So that means investing a lot of my own time and money and energy into um, building up some steam and, and hoping that um, in the coming years the the sort of big heart machine will take over the momentum and start um, flourishing. So as we enter this new year, 2019, I kind of see the collective of your group as kind of an embodiment of what's going on at jazz. But I want to ask you, how healthy is jazz in 2019? As far as I can tell, jazz has never been healthier. You know, people often forget, this kind of harkens back to what you said uh, maybe 10 minutes ago, people often forget because the, the geniuses of jazz are such giants in our collective memory they often forget that those people weren't necessarily famous or uh, conventionally successful during their lifetimes. And I think that's the thing that gives jazz this sort of long-term stability is that the jazz artists don't necessarily focus on career success. They focus on making great music. And they've always done that um, ever since, you know, the beginning of the 20th century and even before that. So today, I think that the same sort of pattern is continuing, but there's the additional sort of element of cross-genre collaborations that's very exciting. Um, you know, personally, I'm very excited to see people like Common or Kendrick Lamar collaborating closely with jazz musicians. And then I'm excited to see artists like Thundercat or Flying Lotus who um, have a completely different background than someone like me, and yet they make music that speaks so strongly to my love of jazz. You know, there's just so much going on all over the world. Yesterday while we were traveling, I was listening to the Itzbere Orchestra Familia, which is uh, a group from Brazil that's a large ensemble that... Um, is is playing jazz and improvised music, but it's like so groundbreaking. And there's got to be thousands of groups that I've never even heard of and may never hear of that are doing great work around the world. So I think that as long as the music is prioritized, it is always going to flourish. And what that might mean in terms of the um, the broader public doesn't really concern me to me it's the music is sacred and as a jazz musician that's what we should all focus on is is serving the music and i just think that there are so many people around the world who are doing an excellent job of doing that that jazz is in great shape for the future right on i think that's a very positive triumphant way to wrap everything up brian thanks for taking a minute out to talk about jazz big heart machine and your your life and music i appreciate it Oh, man, Joe, thank you for being interested, and thanks for calling me. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening and tuning in to yet another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in Chicago, Brooklyn, Kansas City, and spots all over the world giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Brian for his time, his cool, and his stories. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. And for everything Neon Jazz, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time... Enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.